In our program today, we are going to talk about the formation of landscapes, cartography, and a sophisticated means of observing the Earth, remote sensing. The Earth's relief is constantly changing. Chief among the phenomena responsible for this ongoing change is erosion. Erosion can be caused by water, wind, ice. Even the tallest summits will eventually fall prey to erosion. Of course, erosion is a slow process. Generally speaking, over a period of a thousand years, only three to five centimeters of soil is eroded. However, under certain conditions, the process can occur much more rapidly. High in the mountains, for example, the cold, the steepness and the absence of vegetation stimulate erosion. Over a thousand year period, as much as a meter can be worn away. For geologists, the Earth is a living thing whose morphology changes continually. In the eyes of those who have ventured beyond the limits of the Earth, our planet looks like a perfectly smooth sphere. And yet, when they return to Earth, space explorers quickly realize that the surface of the planet is creased and hollowed with cracks. Since its formation, the Earth has been shaped and reshaped constantly by a complex play of natural forces. These forces have successively created reliefs and then flattened them. The emergence of mountains is explained by the continental drift theory. According to this theory, the Earth's crust is subdivided into a dozen enormous plates that fit into each other like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. These plates, known as tectonic plates, are in continuous movement. In some places on the surface of the planet, liquid rock from the depths of the Earth gushes forth between two plates. This pushes the two plates in opposite directions. Elsewhere, the plates converge and collide. These collisions cause the Earth's crust to fold and upthrust, creating chains of mountains. However, as soon as the newly formed reliefs reach open air, they are subjected to an inexorable process of destruction. Over time, that process, called erosion, will cause even the highest mountains to level out. On the whole of the planet's surface, water is the main agent of erosion. The Niagara Falls is one of the most spectacular examples of the erosive power of water. The Niagara River is located on the border of the United States and Canada, in eastern North America. It takes its source from the immense Lake Erie, and pours into Lake Ontario, which is almost as large. The enormous amount of water that circulates there has carved deep gorges and a cataract 50 meters high. But this wonder of nature was not only formed by the action of liquid water, but also by that of ice. Over the past three million years, on a number of occasions, huge glaciers have covered vast areas in North America. These glaciers, in some areas several kilometers thick, were formed by severe climatic cooling. The glaciers were powerful agents of erosion. Like giant scrapers, they literally carved out the landscape, digging valleys and huge depressions separated by steep escarpments. However, about 18,000 years ago, Climatic warming began to melt the glaciers. Vast quantities of water accumulated in these valleys and depressions, forming the Great Lakes and the Niagara River. The erosive action of running water then took over where the great glaciers had left off. The action, which continues to this day, occurred in new stages. The water first proceeded to alter the rock by weakening it. That weakening is produced when water penetrates into the rock's cracks, then evaporates. These cycles of hydration and dehydration cause the rock to contract and dilate successively, making its structure more frail. This physical deterioration of the rock is accompanied by chemical decomposition. 
River water contains a natural acid derived from the dissolution of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That acid dissolves certain minerals in rock, weakening the rock even more. The alteration of the rock was followed by a second stage, erosion. Erosion is caused by running water which tears off small fragments of the altered rock and carries them away. The faster the water flows, the faster the erosion. How fast a rock will erode depends upon its resistance. The soil on which the Niagara River flows is made up of a series of layers of rock. These various layers do not resist erosion in the same way. For instance, the upper layer, made up of dolomite, is very erosion resistant, whereas the lower layers, the bedrock, is made of schists and is less so. Due to the resistance of the upper layers, water eroded the bedrock faster. In time, it carved a steep wall in the rock. Then, as the lower layers are eaten away, the rock's upper layer caves in. This is known as retreat and is what caused the deep gorges in the Niagara River, where it occurs at the rate of roughly one meter per year. Scientists have determined that over the past 12,000 years, the Niagara Falls have traveled backwards some 12 kilometers. Their travels are far from over. Indeed, the falls continue to shape the landscape they flow through. Along the falls, imposing masses of fallen rock have on occasion buried human creations. Accidents like these attest to the power of the forces of nature, seen at work here as they are everywhere else in our world. Geographical maps came about due to man's need to locate himself in space. Even with their limited means, the ancients tackled the difficult task of representing the world. Their maps were, we could say, decorative. They portrayed the winds, mythical beasts, imaginary places. But the pilgrimages and voyages of the explorers created a need for realistic maps. Geographical maps are still made today but the sophistication of our technology is equal only to our need for precision. Of all the tools man possesses to help him move about the world, one of the most versatile has to be the map. In countless areas of human activity, from military strategy to tourism, we would be lost without our maps. The accuracy of maps has considerably improved over the centuries. However, cartography has always come up against a barrier. How to represent the earth, which is both spherical and rough, on a piece of paper, which is flat and smooth. That problem has never been solved, since it is mathematically impossible to transpose a sphere onto a flat surface without deforming it. And yet modern cartography techniques can minimize that distortion. Topographical maps are the point of departure for modern maps. A topographical map represents the localization of objects in the form of symbols and the relief in the form of contour lines. To draw up a topographical map, crews of geometer surveyors first go out into the area. Their work consists of determining the coordinates of a given number of ground reference points. These reference points are marked with a bolt or a bronze plate. Generally, they correspond to elements easily recognizable from the air, such as the crossing of two roads or the summit of a mountain. With different techniques, the surveyors determine the latitude of every site or its position in relation to the equator. Its longitude, which is its localization in relation to the Greenwich Meridian in England, and its altitude, that is, its elevation above median sea level. Geographical latitude and longitude used to be drawn up using a theodolite, a sort of telescope, and with electronic devices to measure distance. Elevation was determined with levels. 
For a few years now, a site's latitude, longitude, and elevation can be established by a receiver that picks up the radio signals of a fleet of satellites orbiting the Earth. Measures obtained this way are highly accurate. Once the surveyors have obtained a sufficient number of these reference points, the next step begins. Aerial photography of the territory. From a plane equipped with a special camera, pictures of the ground are taken vertically so as to show the territory to be mapped in its entirety. These pictures are taken in long, parallel strips. In any strip, 60% of every photograph superimposes the adjacent photos, and every strip covers about 30% of the adjacent strips. This characteristic enables experts to obtain a three-dimensional view of the territory. Every point on the ground appears on at least two aerial photos taken at slightly different angles. When you look at two of these pictures with a stereoscope, the two images fade together, giving an illusion of depth. Thanks to stereoscopy, the cartographer can recreate a three-dimensional model of the territory he's interested in. To do this, he first locates the reference points on the photographs defined by the ground crews. These points enable him to determine the exact position and direction of every photograph as well as the altitude of the land. Using a device called a stereoscopic tracer, the cartographer then extracts the information contained in the aerial photographs. This device allows him to transpose to a computer screen various elements, such as the course of rivers, highway routes, and the position of houses. Every object is identified with a code or a symbol. With the tracer, he can also join all the points of same altitude together so as to create the contour lines. Some objects, such as roads and houses, may be too small or too close together to be clearly visible, and they must be slightly displaced. The data stored on magnetic tape is relayed to a graphic tracer. The map draft thus obtained will be corrected. The cartographer also integrates certain data that is not visible in the aerial photographs, such as political borders. Finally, the names of places, lakes, cities, and mountains are added. Cartography is rapidly changing. Digitizing, which is the translation of cartographic data into computer language, has already made possible the development of highly elaborate geographical data systems. For example, to the geographical data, such as the direction and force of currents, is added data on the inventory of marine resources, such as the various species of fish in the region. Should an oil spill ever occur, this would facilitate cleanup operations. The development of systems like these would enable us to better manage our planet's limited resources. Nowadays, there exist various kinds of specialized maps. Some show the relief, others the nature of the subsoil. If the accuracy of maps is virtually limitless, it's because we have perfected our means of investigation. You may have already seen satellite photographs. The range of colors in these pictures is amazing. They seem to no longer correspond to reality as we are used to seeing it. These highly precise photographs of the Earth's surface were taken by a process called remote sensing. For over 20 years, satellites have been given the mission of observing our planet. They have become indispensable in many fields, such as meteorology, agriculture, forestry, and oceanography. But only in the last few years have scientists developed a powerful long-distance method of studying and interpreting the Earth's surface, remote sensing. This technique, using computers and satellites, 
contributes to a better management of our resources and helps us preserve them. Somewhat like human vision, remote sensing makes it possible to analyze from a distance light reflected from objects. When we look at a landscape from way up in the air, our eye picks up the light reflected by the surface of the ground. We are able to identify the various elements in the landscape due to two characteristics of that light. One is intensity, or the amount of light coming from an object. And the other is the wavelength of the light reflected by the object. That wavelength, which goes from violet to red through all shades possible, defines the color of the object. The intensity and wavelength of the reflected light provides us with a great deal of information on the nature of the elements that form a landscape. However, our eyes have their limitations. The eye perceives only a very narrow strip of all the waves that make up light. All these waves form a very large spectrum. Besides visible light, that spectrum includes gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet and infrared rays, microwaves, and radio waves. These waves reflected by the surface of the Earth constitute a veritable palette of invisible colors. Remote sensing makes some of those colors visible. To do this, special sensing devices are used. They're placed on an airplane or a satellite. Some of them can pick up invisible rays, especially infrared. Others, visible wavelengths, namely blue, red, and green. These sensors also measure the intensity of the reflected light. Quite different from photographs, the pictures obtained are made up of millions of dots called pixels, short for picture elements. Every pixel can record 256 different levels of intensity of light. This data is relayed to receiving stations where it is processed. Such data processing consists of choosing and analyzing the wavelengths reflected by the object. The results of the analysis are then displayed on a video screen using a color code created to make certain elements of the ground stand out. For example, this method can be used to distinguish different zones in a forest, such cutting areas or areas subjected to insect attacks. Remote sensing brings these various areas out. For instance, in this picture, the dark green surfaces correspond to coniferous forests, the light green surfaces to broadleaf tree areas, the pink parcels to recent cuts, the pale green zones to regenerated areas, and finally, the red surfaces to those having suffered insect attacks or fires. Thanks to these pictures, foresters are able to measure the exact surface of the areas cut and evaluate the regeneration rate of the forest. This helps to improve forest management. Another promising remote sensing application is the study of oceans. Oceans cover two-thirds of the planet's surface and are vitally important to climatic equilibrium and to the food of humankind. The temperature of the ocean surface is directly related to marine productivity and weather. Thanks to remote sensing, scientists can evaluate the temperature of the surface of the ocean to within one half degree. They do this by measuring the intensity of the thermal infrared rays on the ocean surface. The intensity of these rays is proportional to the temperature of the water. This data enables them to assess the concentrations of phytoplankton, the microscopic algae which are at the base of the ocean's food chain. Their localization on satellite pictures is very useful for studying marine pollution, as well as finding favorable fishing areas. Applications for remote sensing are increasing by the day. For example, satellite pictures are now so detailed they can be used to draw up topographical maps. 
This would make the creation of certain types of maps possible, where information concerning the vegetation or use of the soil could be added to conventional geographical data. Remote sensing heralds a veritable revolution in our comprehension and management of the planet. The first nautical charts date back to the 13th century. Even then, they took pains to represent the reefs, shoals, and shorelines as accurately as possible. But some of these maps are very difficult to interpret. The navigators sometimes invented secret signs so as not to give away their geographical knowledge to rival powers or competitors.